Hey there, I'm Sourcemake and welcome to the C++ Advanced Multi-Threading Guide. So in this video, we're going to look at the tools that you're going to need if you want to make a really actual multi-threaded program in C++ with the proper practices and you just want to see how it's done the real way, then this video is where you're going to see how to use the code. And as usual, I've got my website open here. It's got all the code that you need. Go ahead and click the link below this video if you'd like to get to this webpage and go ahead and hit the subscribe button for this YouTube channel while you're there. And this is an advanced guide, as I said. We already did a video on an introduction to multi-threading. So if you don't know what multi-threading is or you want to see the first video, click the link below this video. It'll take you to the first video. You'll get up to speed and then you'll know what this stuff is. So let's get right into it. What is multi-threading? I'm not going to say because you should know from the first video. But we're, we're going to start out with a problem. We're going to have a story of multi-threading. And to demonstrate this code, I've got Windows open. And I'm going to open a PowerShell window here. And I'm going to type bash to turn it into a bash window so that it's running Ubuntu commands. And I'm just going to close this. This is the usual way I set my space up. And you can see our project folder has a make file that is just going to compile our code using pthread so we can use multi-threading. And it's also got a main.cpp file, which is blank right now. So we're going to be running all the code on my Windows computer. We are not using a virtual machine because you won't see the effects of multi-threading because when I use VirtualBox to test this, it doesn't use extra threads. It doesn't have extra threads available to it. Again, a lot of this depends on your CPU. So let's get right into this, the story of multi-threading. Let's say we have a function that we want to use a bunch of times. And let me just copy this code. And then we'll look at it. So let me minimize this. So very basic um, program that, that we have right now. So we've got this function, void source make multi. And what it does is it increments this number, this global int num by one. And it says C out, and it says source make called source make multi num times. And you can see in main where we start the program, we call this three times. So, so what happens is we, uh, when our program starts, num gets initialized to zero, then main gets called, and it calls this. Num gets incremented to one. We output that it got run one time. It happens again, num gets incremented, C out output something. And again, one more time it happens. So let's just type. Let me save this first of all, and let's type make. And this is really basic. You should know what's going to happen. So it's make, we, we call this function three times, exactly what we expect. But this is an issue because this kind of leads to why we would use multi-threading. We're calling the same function three times, but why wouldn't we use extra threads if we could? Because normally what's going to happen is we have to wait sequentially for this one to finish, and then this function call to finish, and then this one. And in reality, when you the whole reason for multi-threading is to be able to do things at separate times. So that's our motivation for using multi-threading. You should already know that from the first video. And you should also know from the first video that you can spin off these functions on separate threads, which we're going to do in this next bit. So we're including thread now, and we still got num. This function is exactly the same as before, but what is changed is we have thread t1, and basically what this does is it calls our source make multi function, but it spins it off on a separate thread. So each of these gets called on a separate thread. This line is going to get spun off on a separate thread, and our code is going to continue to execute. So it moves to this line before waiting for this to finish. Instead of being procedural, it just does its own thing on the side. And right here, we wait for these threads to join up to finish. So, so these lines are going to get executed no matter what. Then this one will wait for this to finish before moving on. This will wait for this thread to finish before moving on, and etc. And you can do that. So, so all this code gets spun off on other threads, and we're happy. But this is really bad, because when we make this time, you can see that some weirdness happens. And I'm going to type make one more time. And it's not even the same thing that happens each time. You see, each time some like weird stuff comes out and what's happening? It's not, even though our function is the same, we're still calling the same things. What happens is we are spitting off these functions onto separate threads, but they're using the same resource. So this num is a global resource that's trying to get used by this thread and this thread and this thread. And C out is also a global resource that is trying to be used by three different threads. And that's never good. You never use shared resources with multiple threads. 
and that's why e- even if you did some like special tricks which i've done before like using an array for each one of the threads and then at the end of all these joins adding up whatever you get from the return from this so so if you wanted to do some extra work like have this compute 1 to 1000 for a for loop and and have this one compute 1001 to 2000 and have this one compute like 2001 to 3000 just to speed up programs stuff like that if you were trying to um, use threads to make work faster and then at the end you have these stored in separate variables so that you can add them up at the end to get the final result or something like that just some, you could do some tricky stuff like that but the whole issue is you need to not use shared resources between threads and we're going to see that to not use that, we use these things called mutexes. So I'm going to actually type this out with you because there are only going to be a few changes. The first change is that we are going to include mutex. And I'm going to explain what mutexes are in a second. So we're going to include mutex. And we're going to say mutex mu. We're declaring a variable named mu that is of type mutex. And the last thing that we're going to do is we are going to say mu.lock and the indenting is a little weird here I'm going to say mu.unlock so this is like where multi-threading really you're knowing what you're doing if you use mutex is sort of basically a mutex is a lock and you take the smallest piece of code that is going to use a shared resource which in this case is the these two lines and what you do is you lock it so once this mu lock happens it'll say okay no other thread can use this resource until I unlock this code. It basically puts a lock around this code so that if one of the other threads is using is up to this part of the function, no other threads can are allowed to do to use this because it's a shared resource, but you don't want other threads accessing it at the same time because the analogy that I use on the website is what happens if you have like one smartphone and you've got three people that are trying to use it. Well, one person might try to dial some numbers to call the person they want another person might try to do, like make a phone call at the same time which wouldn't make any sense another person might try to text at the same time and you, you just can't share one phone with three people at the same time it doesn't work that's the same thing with shared resources so what mutexes do is it says okay this person got to the phone first until they finish using what they're doing which is either texting or they're, they're calling or they're dialing someone's number. I don't know. They're speaking into it. It doesn't matter. Until it unlocks, no one else can use the phone. No one else can use these resources. And, and basically, the way you use mutexes is whenever you have some shared resources, you put a lock around it so that it works. And, and let's compile this just to make sure. So we're going to make this time, and we have the expected output. With only four lines of extra code, remember, you just declaring a mutex variable after including it and then you lock around the parts of shared resources that shouldn't be shared and i've got a little bit more on this on the website and you'll see some more resources at the end of this video and that's really good but sometimes there are just parts of code where we're multi-threading where you have some work that you want to do and you just want to spin it off on another thread and get it back in the future whenever you're ready. And it's not good to use mutexes there. It's, it's fine, but there's often easier ways. And I'm going to show you with this code right here. Hopefully you know what mutexes are. Again, you can read about it if you don't, but I, I explained it. It should be clear. You just lock pieces of shared resources in, in code. And you can see that in this piece of code, okay, let's go through it. You've got include IO stream, you're including future, and I'll explain what that is. And now you've got a new function. We've got source make multi, but this time what it does is it increments this number a hundred thousand times, I don't know, a million times. It has a for loop that increments this number and then it returns the number. So basically all it does is kill some time. And this is to simulate a job that we're doing that that we want to spin off on another thread that's going to take some time and we'll get the re return value back later so this happens often especially in asynchronous languages like node where you have some work that needs to be done but you can't block the main thread so just do the work now like on a separate thread and then later on in the program w when we need it we'll ask for it so that's what a future is so we've got this int num we output it to the command line which is zero and then we say auto my future, which is a future, 
and we're using the auto keyword. And we're saying std async, which is the other thing we're using. We're using async and futures as this is the final part of our multi-threading. And async and futures are it. So async basically, and this is the syntax for it. I know it's a little weird, but that's the way you have to use it. It's just the way it works, honestly. So you're saying you are launching the source make multi function off on an async task that's going to be launched. And what you're actually doing is you're storing it into this future variable because later on you're going to get the value into an integer that you want. So again, let, let's go through this code. You're declaring a variable named num and you are saying, I need to run this function source make multi, but I'm going to do it asynchronously using the async function. And I'm going to store the value whenever it, whenever it comes back. It's, it's going to be facilitated by this my future. So the work gets done on a separate thread. Eventually, later on, you can blah, blah. You can do other work in here. And then later on, when you need this value, you say you check to see if the future is valid, which that's just the syntax that I saw. So that's what we're going to use. And you say my future dot get, which will return the value, which in this case is an integer. So we're storing that in num. And we output that num. So num should be zero. Then it should be what a hundred thousand because that's what gets returned from the asynchronous work we're doing. And let's let, let me save this and let's make. And yes, yeah, so so again, we did some we spun some work off on a separate thread that's going to return a value. And when we need that value in our code, that then we ask for it from the future. So instead of blocking work and waiting for this to be done we can actually just do other stuff in between waiting for this value to come back. And then when we need it, we, we just get it and then do whatever we got to do with it, which in this case was outputting it. So those are asyncs and futures. You would use that if you need some work done on a separate thread and you can wait for it. The way you would use mutexes is you would just lock pieces of shared resources. And you know, if, if you need to just do some work on the side, use async and futures. If you don't, if you need to use mutexes, then use mutexes. And basically, that's multi-threading. If, if you know to use mutexes in your threads, then you're good. And if you just need work done that you're going to wait for, use futures. It depends on what your application is to obviously determine when to use these. So just, you know, think about it yourself. Think about the architecture. When you think about multi-threading programs, you actually have to think of the architecture basically just as much as like object-oriented stuff. It makes a big deal. So plan accordingly. And some final pro tips is from this article. So I love this article personally. Top 20 C++ multi-threading mistakes and how to avoid them. Go ahead and read this article. I'm not going to like copy their stuff, but th there are two important things that I'm just going to mention that I didn't mention. The first one is don't get into deadlock, which will happen if you lock one thread and lock another thread with separate mutexes and the threads basically wait for the other one to lock. So I love this example. What happens is thread one locks A, thread two locks B, then thread one locks B and thread two locks A. And what happens is you can see a is like the outer loop and B is the inner lock. And what happens is you're waiting for B to unlock before unlocking A. But at the same time, thread two is waiting for um, A to unlock to do B. It's just weird. You should really read through it and you need to intuitively think of this yourself. So that is multi-threading advanced with C++. Hopefully you know how to use it a little bit more now. Obviously you're going to have to read through documentation to really get good at it. And you will also need to practice. So go ahead and copy this code. Try to run it on your own computer. See if you can get the same results that we got. And if you do, that's great. And multi-threading really helps you make your programs better. It's really, it's necessary to utilize like the CPUs that you're using. That's the whole concept of programming, right? You have a CPU that's doing work for you and it's like your little calculator. So the whole point is making the most out of it. So that's multi-threading. I'm Source Make. If you like this video, please subscribe. Maybe we'll do more multi-threading projects in the future. So follow me on Twitter, Twitch, every everything else. Thanks for watching.